Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Greg Williams and I will be your host for today's webinar. Today's program is part of our ISD Now series brought to you by the University of Maryland Baltimore County also known as UMBC. UMBC is a public university located in Baltimore, Maryland. We have been ranked by US News and World Report as the number one up-and-coming university for two years in a row. We were also featured in a segment on CBS's 60 Minutes. Today's webinar is sponsored by UMBC's online graduate program in instructional systems development. Now here's the exciting part you've all been waiting for, the, we the webinar ground rules. If you have any technical difficulties, such as audio, please call GoToWebinar support line at 1-800-263-6317. If you are having trouble hearing audio, please log off, then log back in. I strongly advise everyone to close any other open web browsers or software applications since this may impact the quality of the webinar for, for you. So how can you communicate with us? You will have the ability to communicate and ask questions using the question function. We will monitor questions and give Connie the ones that seem to strike a chord, if we have a lot of them, with the audience. You may also use the question function to respond to the, any presenter questions or to make comments of your own. We do have a lot of people online and we'll do our best to answer all your questions, but it's possible we might not get to everyone. Besides answering questions at 45 minutes past the hour, Connie will also pause at a few points in the presentation to answer questions. This webinar is being re-recorded. We will email you the link as soon as the video is posted. Additionally, Connie has agreed that her slides be available as a PDF file and we will provide you with a link after the webinar. Connie, are you out there? Hi, Greg, I am, and I'm so impressed that you could pronounce my name. Well, you know, when you say it wrong for two years, then you find out the right <laughs> way. Uh, you, look, you look pretty good, but um, I finally got it right. I'd like Great. to give uh, Connie her formal introduction here. Connie Malamed uh, consults, writes, and speaks in the fields of online learning, visual communication, and information design. She's the author of Inst Instructional Design Guru iPhone application and the book Visual Language for Designers, which presents visual design principles based on cognitive science. She also publishes the popular blog, which, which I love personally, called The E-Learning Coach. With degrees in instructional design and art education, Connie energetically pursues ways to improve instructional and informational graphics. Connie, I'm going to hand over the presenter's wand to you right now. So here we go. Okay, toss it over here. I'll see if I can catch it. All right, don't drop it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Greg, and I love your ISD Now program. So uh, I'm happy to be here, everyone. Hello. Let's just make sure everything's working right. There we go. Visuals are so powerful that they can turn this statement, neglected children are made to feel invisible, into a powerful plea to end child neglect. Visuals persuade. Visuals are so powerful. They can show us things that are invisible, things that can't be seen without a telescope or microscope, or things that we can only imagine. Visuals show hidden information. Visuals are so powerful that Florence Nightingale discovered by visualizing statistics, visualizing statistics that deaths from preventable diseases during the Crimean War were greater than deaths from wounds. And as a result of this, by showing this evidence, she convinced Queen Victoria to improve sanitary conditions in military hospitals. Visuals solve problems. Visuals are so powerful that this plaque was placed on two pioneer spaceships in the 1970s. Scientists knew that if there was any hope of communicating with other beings, other life forms, pictures would be the best way to do it. Visuals transcend language. Visuals are so powerful 
that almost no one can understand the Affordable Health Care Act because it's 400 pages with no graphics. And when Dan Rome, the author of The Back of the Napkin, went onto SlideShare and created these very simple, cartoony, stick figure explanations, a half of a million people viewed it because visuals explain. Visuals are so powerful that we can now see at one time what was an inconceivable amount of data as in this New York Times interactive graphic that shows how different segments of the population spend their time throughout the day in the U.S. Visuals promote new ways of thinking. So welcome to this webinar, Visual Language for Designers. It's based on my book, Visual Language for Designers. And if a lot of this sounds familiar, I've also given a presentation similar to this called Your Brain on Graphics, although this is an updated version. So if you're having a deja vu, that's why. So here's what um, I'd like to explore with you today. Wired for graphics, how our brains are wired for graphics how we can organize graphics for perception, why reducing the realism in graphics can help learners understand, and how to connect with your audience through emotions. As a foundation point, you should know that our brains are completely hardwired for graphics. And if we look at the capabilities of the brain and some of the more important aspects of how we handle and process visual information, we can get better at designing for the human mind. First of all, to start with, our brain, there are more brain resources devoted to vision than to any other sense. In fact, there are 20 billion neurons devoted to perceiving and processing visual information. And I'm hoping no one asks me how they counted that because I don't know. And as a comparison, there are 1,200,000 fibers in the optic nerve, that nerve that goes from the eye to the brain, and there are only 30,000 fibers in the auditory nerve that goes from the ear to the brain. And that's why, probably why we have something, a phenomenon known as the picture superiority effect, which states that we have a better memory for pictures than for words. So for example, if you were teaching someone or you wanted to learn about diamonds and all the different components of a diamond, you could read all of this text. Well, you would not remember that nearly as well as if you saw a graphic like this. The best combination is visuals and text together. That work, that's what the human mind retains best. And it kind of makes sense when you think about how we evolved. Think about a long time ago when we were very concerned, when humans were very concerned about their survival. And the environment was so important, and scanning the environment was so important. Well, pictures are a replica of the environment. They're much closer to the environment than our words, which are more abstract. So it makes sense that our brains would have evolved to be uh, so good at visual processing. A lot of this talk, uh, of this presentation is based on a cognitive model that I think of kind of as a funnel system. It, as a simplification, there are three memory stores, sensory memory, working memory, and long-term mem memory. And as sensory information, and I'm only thinking of visual and auditory because that's what's involved in so much of our e-learning and uh, Instructional designers work with those senses a lot. As visual and auditory inf information pours into our sensory memory, it's only held there for a brief amount of time. And then just a little bit sifts through the funnel and is held into working memory. And working memory is that memory in which we're online. It's the working memory where we manipulate information in the moment. And then just a teeny small amount gets into long-term memory and is encoded permanently in long-term memory. So working memory really limits the information we process. It has a very limited capacity, maybe something like, they used to say seven bits of information, but now they're saying maybe more like four to five bits of information. So that's all that working memory can hold. 
and it is a very short duration, possibly 10 seconds. And that's why when someone gives you their phone number, you want to put it right into your cell phone immediately or else you know you will forget it. The only way we remember things in working memory is to rehearse them and repeat them over and over again. Well, what about long-term memory? Well, it turns out that we have an amazing long-term memory for pictures. And in this one experiment, actually there have been several experiments, they showed participants over 2,500 pictures. And even several days later, 90% of the participants could still remember what pictures they had seen. So we have an immense ability to store, to store picture information. And people really give meaning to the visuals they process, and it's important to remember that. Because the arrows are going both ways. We're not just looking at something. When we perceive it, we put on our own, we filter it with our own preconceived ideas, our own expectations and likes and dislikes, our values and our beliefs. Perception and interpretation are also affected by age, culture, educational background, and language. So whenever you're developing graphics, you have to keep in mind that people are going to give meaning to these visuals. And Stephen Coslin, a well-known cognitive psychologist, wrapped it up perfectly. The mind is not a camera. And it's really important to remember that because I think we all go around, I know I do, thinking that people are just recording the environment and their world as it's happening. But no, people are perceiving it and interpreting it in their own unique ways. And of course, graphics can fail. How many people saw this graphic several years ago floating around the internet? It was our strategy in Afghanistan uh, presented to General Stanley McChrystal. And it was floating around the internet as like one of the worst graphics, PowerPoint graphics anyone has ever seen. And what he said was, when we understand that slide, we'll have won the war. And because graphics can be so poor, that's what got me interested in research-inspired design. Not design that looks good only, but design that's based on research. It's based on findings and evidence, it considers how people perceive and comprehend visual information, and it wouldn't be worth anything if we couldn't apply it to the real world, and that's what I'm interested in. So today I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit and learn about how to align our cognitive architecture with visual language. And so here are one of the uh, three principles I'd like to talk about today. And the first one is organizing for perception. Oh, by the way, before we go on, Greg, would you, were there any questions that um, we have for on that last topic, Wired for Graphics? Uh, no. Nobody chatted in any uh, questions. You do have the ability to use the question function to communicate with us folks, and um, we'll be happy to uh, relay, relay those to Connie. Connie, uh, so far, no questions. I think that's because I'm so mesmerizing. Probably. That's probably that's, that's, yeah. That was my thought. <laughs> okay, well, organizing for perception. Now, this is so fascinating. When you organize a graphic for perception, you speed up your message. And there are a lot of reasons why getting your message across quickly is a good idea. Uh, does any, you can type in the question box there. Does anyone have any reason, any uh, idea of why you might want to get your message across quickly? People have short attention spans. Yep. There are time constraints, it will save money, people lose interest quickly, time is prime, it helps convey meaning, it captures attention for a quick response. Limits of working memory efficiency, boy, everybody's just doing great because those are all great reasons and I agree with all of them. So something really cool happens when we're looking around our environment. Of course, we all know about conscious processing, but there's something else that's happening pre-consciously, and it's called pre-attentive processing, and it's a kind of processing that we are not aware of. But anyway, the brain is always scanning the environment, looking for information of interest. It helps us make sense of the world so that when we're ready to select and when we're ready to pay attention to something, 
we have a well-organized set of information and we know where to put our attention. So because of pre-attentive processing, we can take advantage of that in our design, in our visual design. Two things that occur during pre-attentive processing are certain attributes of a graphic will pop out at us even though we're not aware of it. It's kind of like that thing when you're in a room full of people and someone mentions your name and you weren't listening at all and it kind of pops out at you, you hear them mentioning your name. And another thing that, that we notice is when items are grouped together and we can take advantage of both of these and use them for the design. So let's look at pop-out first. What pops out? Cognitive psychologists call it the primitive features of a graphic pop out at you. So when you look at this graphic, you can answer in the question area. When you look at this graphic, what pops out at you? I think it's kind of obvious, but the red, the red, the red, the red, the red, the red, <laughs> yep, the middle piece. And so color is a primitive attribute that pops out at us during pre-attentive process. And there are a lot of ways we can use color in e-learning or in training presentations. For example, Let's say you were telling a story about someone that was a little bit different at your company. Or perhaps you're telling people at your company that being different is okay. The green shoes automatically pop out. Color pops out very easily. So that's one way to use it. One really good way to get better at visual design is to look at all the advertisements and the websites and the billboards and the signs in the metro that are all around you. And notice that in this website, you can see that the two buttons that they want you to press really pop out. They're a, real, a very bright color. So advertisers use these pre-attentive processing tricks all the time. What attribute of this graphic stands out here? Yes, it is the size of the hand. So size pops out at us. That's one of the primitive attributes. Someone is saying detail. Not Right now, detail does pop out, but I think you have to process that to see it first because I, I haven't ever seen that listed as one of the pre-attentive processing things. And someone else mentioned proximity, that everything was close together. And that is something that applies to grouping, so that's correct too. So let's look, you can use size in information graphics. This is a bubble chart, and you tend to notice the larger bubbles first. Advertisers use size. What's the first thing when you go to Apple, to the Apple site that you see on the screen? What captures your attention? The largest item. You can also use size for humor. Just making the juxtaposing something unusually large. Now here, this one's a little bit might be harder to get. It's shape, and shape is another attribute that pops out at us. Here's an information graphic. You, you right away you notice the unusual shape. What do you think about this one? What attribute pops out here? Any guesses? Contrast, direction, orientation, choices, difference, yep. Well, anyway, it's orientation or direction is another primitive attribute that pops out. We tend to notice something that goes in, we, we notice how images are oriented. And of course, if you want something to pop out at you, then you're going to make it in, the other, in, in its own direction. You can do that with people, if you're telling a story. I'm not sure when you would do it with fish, but it's a good example. And this one's a little bit hard to get because of the red arrow. So I'm, we're not looking for color here, but does anything else pop out at you on this one? 
on this graphic? Movement. Mm -hmm. The man and the direction too. That's true. Forward moving. There's something really interesting that goes on in terms of movement. And you can almost feel it in your brain once you know about it. And that is, they've done a lot of experiments that showed that when people see something moving in a photograph or an illustration, it activates that part of the brain that processes motion. So that means when you see something moving, it's almost as though when you see a still moving, it's almost as though you're seeing an animation or a movie moving. See what happens here. You can almost feel that part of your brain. It's almost as though you see these nurses running. And moving doesn't have to be with, image, with uh, people. In this case, you've got a pie chart, and it kind of looks like the yellow slices getting pulled out. So you can have motion in objects, and someone mentioned that this has color too, and that's true. If it were my graphic, I got it from a stock photo site, I would probably make everything else a very uh, muted pie uh, color and just have the, the yellow, the one I really wanted to show and prom as prominent to pop out. I only have color in one of them. Now this one is rarely used, and I think because it takes a lot of artistic uh, talent, but I think there are other ways that we can that we can figure out to use it, and that's depth. And look at it close up, and this is a kind of a brilliant approach to make something pop out at you. It's showing where the highest density population areas are in the United States, and it does it in depth. I thought that was a pretty cool example. I wanted to show you this example again because the whole reason you want to use pop out is to build a visual hierarchy and when you're building a visual hierarchy you're getting the learner or the viewer you're controlling what they look at first and every visual should really have a visual hierarchy you want to show people what to look at first what to look at next and so on and often visual designers will use three levels of visual hierarchy and in this example I'm really only concerned with one because the designer wanted the first diamond at the top to show up and it's the largest and it immediately catches our eye. So that's one of the ways you can use pop out to create your visual hierarchy and think about what do I want the learner to look at first? What's most important? So as a review, the features that pop are color, size, shape, orientation, movement, and depth. So then the other aspect of, of um, pre-attentive processing is grouping and that's the when we pre-attentively process information we notice what's grouped together and there are certain perceptual conditions that force us to see parts as one unit. We, see, we move parts into holes, we see little parts into holes and you can see an example of it here with the United States. And we can use this to create meaning. By grouping and joining things together, we create meaning to the viewer. And you also want to make sure that you don't do the opposite and have things close together that shouldn't be. So you'll create meaning when it shouldn't be there. In other words, you'll create a misunderstanding. Here's an example. And one of the conditions is proximity, when things are close together, and several of these are based on what the Gestalt psychologists figured out in the 1920s. When, um, when, when items are close together, we assume that they're group, grouped. So in this case, who's not washing their hands? It shows by activity on the left and by location on the right. And if you try to separate these and see them individually, it's very hard because our brains are wired to see these as a group because proximity causes this. Here's another example. In this pie chart, it's a little bit difficult to tell what goes together, but it can be improved through proximity. And this is how we read web pages. We know that the items that are grouped together form a page. And we know that the items that are next to each other are pretty much on the same level. So we use this all the time without being conscious of it. In this example, it shows America's most prescribed psychiatric drugs. And 
this is an example of similarity. Similarity also causes grouping. So in this case, we've got pills that look alike and that are colored alike and shaped alike. And we see them, we see each one of these as a group. Personally, I'm on all of, every one of these, and that's why I'm so happy all the time. I'd like to show this example because it's so easy for anyone to make. Instead of just putting text or numbers on the screen, you can use simple circles and you know make 10 and repeat them and it, it's great for grouping. Now another Gestalt principle is called common fate and it says that graphic elements that are moving in the same direction appear to be grouped. So those arrows on the right appear to be grouped and those kind of pie slices on the left appear to be in another group. They, they all seem to be moving in each group they seem to be moving in the, in the right direction. And the same goes for the scatter plot. It all seems to be moving up to the right, and that diagonal line helps. These are two newer discoveries. One is connectedness, and this one seems so obvious to me, I don't even know why anyone needed to discover it. But it states that lines, when lines connect objects, we group the, we group the objects. So this is a graphic about uh, how VOIP works, voice over internet protocol works. And if we didn't have the lines connecting every, all the elements, we wouldn't really know what was what. But in this case, because they're connected, we know that it's one graphic, one diagram describing it. Just a few more examples. I like to show examples to inspire you in your visual design work. And finally, boundaries. When there are lines around a graphic, as in this one from Wired Magazine, which uh, shows how many hours people spend on the internet. This is an old graphic. We probably spend more than that now. You can see that every floor is almost as though it's a group unto itself, the objects on every floor. And that's because there's a boundary line drawn around those. So the conditions that facilitate grouping are proximity, similarity, common fate, connectedness, and boundaries. Greg, is there, uh, are there any questions? Actually, there, there are. Um, people are saying they like the examples. This one goes back a little bit, but um, I'm quoting someone, uh, Shelby. Uh, why are we calling these primitive attributes? Mm, I, have, I think it's because they're basic, and that's just a term that cognitive psychologists use meaning um, foundational or primary. It, it, it's, it's being used in that way. OK. And then someone's asking you to uh, please review the significance of grouping. What does it cause our minds to do? OK, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Uh, grouping causes our minds to take individual objects and perceive them as going together as being in one group. So therefore, it, it creates meaning. Like if, if there weren't lines here, we wouldn't realize that this was a diagram describing how information or data travels. We would just see a man on a phone and a building. But by grouping it, we can better understand that it's a diagram that's connected together, that ha you know, that, uh, is explaining something that's explanatory. So grouping provides meaning. It lets us know what goes together. And you can make a mistake, too. I've done this. I make a graphic, and I put two or three things together. And because of proximity, I suddenly realize that someone would perceive it as a group. But the things have no relationship to each other, so I will spread them apart. I hope that clarifies things. Thank you. And You're there's welcome. one that goes way back towards the beginning, and, and maybe I've overlooked this, was someone was asking, uh, I believe it was Larry, um, is pre-conscious like subconscious? I don't think so. Uh, I, I mean, it, it seems more like a psychologist could explain subconscious, but my understanding of it is that, that those are things that are influencing you from your past and from your upbringing. And whereas pre-conscious is more an act of a phenomenon that happens when you're 
naturally scanning the environment, but you're not yet aware of what you're perceiving. So you're taking in information, but it hasn't become conscious yet. That's my understanding of it. Okay. Which I think is different than subconscious. Okay. All right. I think so we're another... up, to, up to date on the questions now. <laughs> Great. Preconscious is a Freudian term. Thank you. What did they say? Oh, preconscious is a Freudian term. I thought they were saying subconscious is a Freudian term. Um, I think Freud, I'm wondering if Freud meant something different by it, but that's a whole other discussion. Let's get into reducing realism. Oh, this is one of my other favorite principles because there's been some really interesting research by Francis Dwyer at Penn State uh, maybe a decade or two ago that showed that visuals that are simpler are often easier for people to understand. So reducing realism really makes graphics cognitively efficient. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes, but reducing realism provides fewer distractions so that there aren't a lot of visual cues on the screen. They take less time to perceive because your eyes can scan them quickly. And they minimize the load on working memory. Oh, there's one more. They're easier to encode into long-term memory, most likely, and I'll tell you why. It's because reduced realism matches most likely, or at least researchers think this is true, matches our mental images or the way we store uh, visual information. So we have to store information as a representation. And mental representations that preserve the physical character, characteristics of what they represent are mental images. And let me show you an example. So let's see, say you're a cat person like I am and you're walking down the street and you see a cat and later you get home and you think, oh no, I wonder if that cat had a home. I wonder if I should be adopting it. Well, when you think of that cat again, when you visualize it, it's not going to be exact. And many researchers think that we store visual information almost in a cartoonish kind of way. Like we kind of have the color and the shape okay, but it's not a photographic image in our mind that we preserve. So reducing the realism in graphics is closer then to what we're storing as a mental representation. And you can think of graphics as going from high fidelity to low fidelity, which we often think of music in that way, but not necessarily visuals. So here's a high fidelity graphic. It's pretty realistic. It's got a lot of color. When it's black and white, we're, it's getting a little bit lower in fidelity. When it's a silhouette, it's getting a lot lower in fidelity. And a line drawing is just simply the outline. And all of these approaches, can you can use different ones depending on what your goals are. Again, this is another thing that, may, that can help you speed up your message. So looking at this graphic, here's a photograph of a city, and here's a 3D graphic of the city. Do you see a difference? The 3D graphic has, is, has a reduced realism as compared to the photograph. And now this one is even more so. So what do you see in the, in the questionnaire? And it's really hard for me to see that. I can only see a little segment at a time. But, oh, now I'm seeing more. Um, what are some of the characteristics that you see are in, oops, sorry, that are in reduced realism? What, what kinds of things are different between a photograph and an illustration? There's a loss of detail, less color, that's true. Fewer shadows, it's more two-dimensional, less depth, less reality. The colors in this case are exaggerated. That's true because they're flatter, it's, it's simpler, it's shiny. So you get the general idea, it has clean lines. Okay, that's great. So that's what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about reduced realism. And of course, here's an example that's even more so. And now, since everyone in this audience is so brilliant, minimalist graphics have fewer colors, less detail, smooth surfaces, and minimal shadows. I think you said it all. And what I think is so amazing is that when you reduce the realism, as in this graphic below, it doesn't stop us from understanding it because the brain fills in missing information. So just from looking at this graphic, I'm guessing most of you thought that it was international business or international business people or something like that because you've got the suits and you've got the globe and this has come to represent international business. So without having hardly any detail, we kind of, you can communicate a message, communicate a concept. So here's some silhouettes. This is uh, Michelle Obama. It was, a, it was an information graphic about how she moves the, the fashion markets. Every time she wears something, people go out and buy it. 
I don't know what that little graphic behind her is, but just ignore it now that I've pointed it out and brought your attention to it. And a silhouette is usually an area of flat color. In this case, they put a little detail in, which I thought was a kind of a nice effect. Here's another example of using silhouettes for an information graphic. You should keep this in mind when you have statistics to present. And I have an article about that on the eLearning Coach about how to make numbers interesting. Someone says, um, can you provide an example of where you would use uh, minimalist graphics over more complex? Well, certainly when you want people to perceive things quickly, I use them, I just use them a lot. Certainly for novices over um, experts. In information graphics like this, notice that they, they, the percentage is highlighted, so they used um, one of the primitive attributes to highlight the percentage. Here's another good example of when you might want simplicity when you're um, teaching someone about where shape is so important. Silhouettes work great here. There's a little bit of detail. Here's another one to show motion. And in this interactive graphic on the Washington Post, as you click on each number, the illustration goes from one, uh, covers one silhouette, then the next, and the next, and the next. And another example on, sea, on which cities, uh, the sea levels of different cities. Great idea. By, using, by reducing realism, this really helps you get your message across. In this case, we don't need a picture of Los Angeles or South London. We don't need a photograph. All we need is the text and a little bit of a silhouette, and that works because the main thing we want to concentrate on are the water levels. Now, another type of re way to reduce realism is line art. And in this example of how to measure a child's uh, height, you can see that if it were a photograph, it might be difficult to tell which points should be touching the vertical bar. But by making it a line drawing, it's very easy to see. So a lot of times it really clarifies information, especially because we're often involved in instructional graphics. In this brilliant graphic by Nigel Holmes, who you should look up some of his books and some of his artwork. He's great, and he's great with um, line art. He's teaching the uh, protocols of kiss the kissing protocols all around the world. And it took me about uh, he sent this to me for my book, and it took me about 10 minutes to understand it. And when I finally got it, I laughed out loud because it was so brilliant. So you can see that in Paris, the kissing protocol is on both cheeks. In Moscow, it's on the lips. In either Amsterdam or Holland, it's the three kiss. And in New York, it's the air kiss. I just thought that was so funny. And here is... Uh, Nigel Holmes' line drawing of how to tie a scarf. Look how simple it is. He's got a whole book on these simple line drawings. And I think it only costs about $2 on Amazon. And instructionally, if you wanted to learn how to tie a scarf, you really wouldn't need anything else in this simple line drawing. Again, we've, I'm sorry if I'm ignoring the questions. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to answer them at the end. Uh, of this topic and let Greg filter them. Thanks, guys. I hope you understand. It's the time factor here. This is a simple way to show this is an article about Apple's patents. And notice you get the full message just by looking at the arrows and the simple hand gestures. Now, finally, iconic graphics. These are so cool. Iconographics are very reduced, but they're not like silhouettes because they have a little bit of detail, but they're also very quick to uh, perceive and process. You can use iconographics that actually resemble the object. You can use ones that are conceptual. In this case, a broken glass, I've seen that on boxes, it means fragile. You can use an exemplar iconographic, and in this case, let's say you're riding, driving down the road and you see a sign with a knife and fork. Well, you know that it means there's food there. You don't think, oh, it's a knife and fork store. So we learn that, you know, you can, that an exemplar graphic can represent an entire category. And then there are also learned, graphic, learned icons, and these are more like symbols, and we'll get to that in a minute. I just want to show you a few fantastic examples of, of iconic graphics. This is the ingredients to different coffee drinks, different espresso drinks, and it shows you the uh, amount of each ingredient. 
So it's essentially a graph, but done in an, icon, in an icon. I just thought that was really great. Again, another great use of iconic graphics. I think these work really well in e-learning, and I use them a lot. Here's another example. It's easy to find these little people on stock photo sites for, like, for very cheap. Then you just make one different. You can use them in humor. Anyway, I thought that was funny. And then let's talk about symbols. Symbols are essentially learned, and there's something called visual literacy, where people who are in a, in a particular culture learn the visual symbols uh, in their culture. And so therefore, in our culture, we know that an X means something is wrong, and I'm guessing in most Western cultures, and a check means it's right. But it's really important to think of the context, because for example, these concentric curved lines in one context mean Wi-Fi, and yet in another context they mean an RSS reader. So context is important, and keep that in mind. I want to show you a few examples of how I use uh, iconic graphics and silhouettes. For example, I use icons to categorize. So let's say I'm making a, a course and on the you know medical diagnostics would perhaps use this icon and then heart specialties or would use the next icon. That's one way you can do it to categorize things. You can also use it to give a little suggestion. In this case it was a course for the immigration service and it was just I, I didn't really want people to focus on the picture, but I just wanted to kind of dress it up a little and suggest what, what this was about. And another way, just simply when you're you know, I mean, I guess you could say it's eye candy, but it's not 100% eye candy. It gives you a little bit of a suggestion of what this is about, and it makes your statistics a little bit more interesting, and most of all, perhaps it makes them memorable. So you can reduce realism with silhouettes, line art, iconic forms and graphics, and symbols. Um, Greg, maybe I have time for maybe one or two questions? Okay. Um... There's there's a lot of good good questions. Um, there's people asking for websites for graphics available and your recommendations. Well, what do you mean graphics available? Uh, could somebody? I, I, um, I'm not I mean, sure. Just, that, just to look. That just was from Julie. So if Julie wants to clarify that, but she just said, um, "quote I know there are websites that have graphics available. So which sites are the best?" End quote. Hmm. Well, I mean, if you're talking about stock photo sites, that's one thing. And to make it fast, I can just tell you that I have a list under resources on the elearningcoach.com uh, site. If you're talking about where can you view cool graphics, look for um, visual journalists to create uh, information graphics, the real kind of information graphics that compress data and make, you know, provide insights. And look for some of those sites. Just do a Google search for those. And also, you can email me uh, through the contact form at um, the elearningcoach.com, and I can try to get more specific with you. Should we go on, Greg? Okay. Or, uh, um, you, yeah, there's some more questions if you want to take those, but if you have more to cover, that's, that's fine, too. All right. Well, maybe we'll, can we save these for the end because we sure. uh, we're on the last one. And that's connecting to your audience uh, with emotions or through emotions. And I think everyone here knows that emotional content now is really important in motivation and in getting through to your audience and in helping them feel comfortable with things. And I wanted to show you some very emotional graphics and see if they cause a visceral reaction in your body because emotions are really connected to the body. <laughs> um, why don't you just quickly write uh, in the question box which one of these did any of these really touch you and make you feel a certain way even if you didn't like the way you felt of course the doggy is always the most popular and the baby mm -hmm. <laughs> and they don't want nobody wants to talk to the guy on the phone yeah I don't blame you okay so 
you see how emotions, how visuals can really make you and impact your emotions and make you just feel them in your body. And that's so interesting because there was a time, uh, there's a tradition, a philosophical and psychological tradition where people thought that emotions were, you know, on a completely different spectrum than cognition. And now we know that cognition and emotion are really intertwined and we make emotional decisions based on cogn cognition and we make rational decisions based on emotion and it's all tied up together. And emotions really affect mental processes when we're learning. They capture attention, they actually increase brain activity, and they can improve retention because if an experience is emotional, you don't want to make it too strong, but if it's somewhat emotional, people are more likely to remember it. Learners quickly monitor their own instructional experience to see how things are going, and when they get really frustrated, they tend to lose focus and they tend to turn off. One thing you should know is that we're very attuned to faces. There are many different regions or several different regions of the brain that process facial information. It's so important. Imagine in our evolution, you want to know who is that person. So there's the recognition section of the brain. And then there's what is the person feeling? What are they thinking? Am I safe? Is this person an enemy? Is it a stranger? So we've developed a lot of neurons that can process facial information. And we're even attuned to cartoon faces you can read the emotions on these faces. And we also notice what someone is looking at. So eye gaze directs our eyes. Emotional images are, are really effective for changing attitudes. This simple graphic here with a cigarette stamping out health, it says a lot right then, right there in that simple graphic. And you don't even have to have faces. In this graphic about how coal pollutes, Without reading any of the statistics, you know what the, through persuasion, what this person is trying to get across, what message this person is trying to communicate just from seeing the pollution. And there's another side to emotion that we often forget about, especially if you're always working with serious content, which I often do work with, and it's surprise. First of all, there's humor. Surprise results from novelty or humor from the unusual juxtaposition of elements and from the unexpected. Really, if, if you can remember being a kid when someone pinched your cheeks, that's kind of what it felt like. And this is an example of novelty or something that's unexpected. In this food movement video, which when I do this presentation live, I show the, a good portion of the video, which is really cool. You can find it online. This shows how far food has traveled. To get to, its, um, to get to Canada, to different places in Canada. And you don't expect to see mileage or kilometer signs stuck in the food. So this is the way novelty can get people's attention too. So emotions increase brain activity, improve motivation, and it's associated with faces, humor, and surprise. And I want to thank everyone in UMBC and the uh, ISD Now program. I want to tell you about my, that I have a website, if you haven't been there, the elearningcoach.com, and I send out a newsletter with good resources and links about once or twice a month whenever I get the time to do it. And now I can finish with those questions. So Greg, what do you think? Okay, Connie. Um, they're still uh, coming in here. Um, someone's asking if you could quickly review the four points of reducing realism. Okay, but you are going to get, have a PDF of these that you can download, but that's fine. It's still that's, a web. Yes, we will have Connie's slides as a PDF available to people. People have been asking about that, but just to remind you, we will have that. Okay, but there's silhouettes, line art, line drawings, using icons, and using symbols. Those are the four ways that I do it, that I know of. Anything else? Um, people are asking about placement of text. Um, uh, is there a more effective arrangement for text and graphics? For example, placing text above or below, left or right of the image? Well, it really all depends on what your purpose is. Certainly, if the text goes with the image, they should be close together so that you're not splitting attention. If you want people to notice text first, you know, like a big headline, a large title, then you would put it up above. Um, left or right, I don't think I've heard anything of. I think it just depends on the design of your screen or slide. 
whether left or right is okay, but certainly close together, if it's, you know, use proximity, don't split attention if the two are, are related. Okay. Here's a, a, a popular question, I think. What strategies do you suggest for communicating with folks who believe that PowerPoint bulleted lists or who require every presentation be blue? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, a lot of times, I mean, we're stuck with the branding of the organization that we're working for or our clients, so um, I don't know what to say about that other than if you're not really stuck, you can, you know, try. I always think that you can convince people with a few cognitive psychology facts um, or something based from research. You know, you could say in terms of if they're stuck on one color, you could say, well, other colors are... Uh, you know, would create novelty, which would get their attention. Also, the complementary color of blue is orange, so you could say that when we want things to stand out, we'd like, to, you know, it would be good for us to use orange. And what was the first part of that question? Um, with, with about bu list, right? bullet, bo uh, bullet points, when, when people really, like, want to use those. Sure. Um, I would just like to see if you can use some icons to substitute, tell them, you know, get, get some research to show that that bullets, you know, uh, bulleted lists or, you know, people find boring, uh, you know, you can show them articles about that. On my site, I have a, an article that's very popular called Six Alternatives to Bullet Lists. Um, didn't Jane Bozarth write a book about that, too, Beyond Bullet Points? I, I believe you're right. So there we go. Try to convince them with that. Um. Someone's asking if you could provide an example of when or why you would use minimalist graphics over more complex ones. Okay, well, I think I did answer that for novices, when you want to get a message across quickly, when you don't want people to focus in on all those visual cues. For example, in that immigration graphic I showed you, it just showed the silhouette of a man carrying a baby. Um, I didn't want people to focus on it. So um, when you're using it for iconic purposes, such as for a, a mnemonic device, when for showing categories, those are some some times that I use them. I, just, I think that they're cool looking. It can also just be a style that you can use throughout an entire uh, course presentation or any kind of job aid or other materials. Um, you mentioned video briefly on the, the food movement video, but right. someone's asking, um, you know, of course this was on graphics, but what, what about video? Is video better than static graphics? Well, it really depends. If, if motion is involved in, you know, one, one of the main reasons to use video and animations is if motion is involved in the thing that's, uh, that you're trying to uh, teach. So in many cases, um, video and animation are obviously are great for showing motion. You have to make sure that people can back up, that it doesn't go too quickly. Um, video is good for showing role plays. You know, for anything where people have to see um, movement, role playing. Let me think of anything, any other reasons. Any, does anyone else have any other suggestions? I know there are reasons why people, uh, if you can think of other reasons, type it in. Other reasons why you would use vi video. Talking heads, eh, that's not so, you know, so interesting unless you can really change the shot frequently. I come up against that a lot. A lot of clients want to use talking heads, and I, I really try to keep it very short. When you're demonstrating something, yes, of course, when you're demonstrating something. And anything that's how-to, how to assemble something. But you know what's interesting? A series of stills can often work better than showing uh, video. And it's possible that maybe even both, so where people can look at it both ways. Trying to change attitudes, yep, that's another reason to use video. Thanks, my mind was going blank. Great, great answers. I love learning people. Go ahead. People are also asking about uh, repetition mm -hmm. of graphics, and then someone else asked about fonts. Do they matter as well? Yeah, that's a whole other issue, and I do have a few articles about typefaces. Yes, they really do matter, and people, um, visually literate uh, audiences, unconsciously, or I don't know, have, have a sense of whether a typeface fits or not. There's been some interesting uh, research on that, and I'm pretty sure I wrote about it, that on my site. And um, the first one, a repetition. Repetition in a graphic and in a course helps bring unity to it. So repetition is definitely one of the princ a visual design principle. And like all principles, you have to do it, you know, just right. Don't go overboard, but 
repeating, uh, for, let me make a quick example. If you have a, a circular theme, perhaps like on your title page, then you might want to use a, that, that same circular theme throughout the course, throughout your slides or screens here and there to like kind of tie it all together. Repetition definitely gives unity, visual unity. Here's a question about cartoons. I have a leader who hated what she perceived as, quote, cartoon art. She always mm -hmm. insisted we use photographs. Can you comment on why you think she may have felt that way? Right. Well, I, I tend to not use clip art, you know, or co real cartoony things for a lot of audiences, but there might be some that I would. Um, I think it ha kind of has a, some people see it as juvenile. Uh, some people see it as, you know, not very good as compared to, font, you know, good, uh, uh, well done illustrations. And there is a certain amount of visual design that is completely subjective. So, you know, especially if the person is your boss or your client, there might not be much you can do about it. I think it's important if you are using cartoons that it's completely appropriate. I well, I guess uh, there I guess there is a, um, a a trend now to show illustrated people, but usually they're not exactly cartoons. They look kind of uh, you know they look well done. In fact, let me give um, Kevin Thorne a plug. Nuggethead he just released a whole uh, stock photo selection of illustrated characters that you might like. So um, I think it's Nuggethead Studios. Check that out. Okay. Um, someone's asking about do emotional visuals need more detail to work? That's an interesting question. I mean certainly you saw that cartoon faces tend to work. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't, I don't think I've, I know the answer uh, except from my own experience. And it does seem like if you were acting out a scenario that having uh, real photographs Photograph, realistic photographs would be more uh, have more emotional impact than cartoon drawings. However, you know, really fine and well-made illustrations might be equal to that. I'm curious uh, what people think. Maybe you can put your answers. What you would vote for for emotions, il um, illustrations or photographs? Just put it in the question box. I'd like to see what people say. And someone asked about, uh, what are your thoughts about using imagery in assessments? I do that when it doesn't distract, when you need, when someone needs the, you know, a, the reference, a chart or, or a um, diagram or a table. Um, I don't know how helpful it would be unless maybe you're telling a story, you know, and then it's a scenario. Mm -hmm. Then it might be okay. It, it could be distracting. A lot of times there's no one answer and it depends and you should just go ask, you know, five people around you what they think and get their get their input. Uh, and well, of course, better than that would be asking members of the target audience. But we don't often get in touch, you know, have a chance to do that. So I would just do your own little research and see what you think, see how people re respond. And somebody corrected us, Connie, on the um Beyond bullet points, a couple people um, chatted in. Cliff Atkinson is the author on that. Jane wrote something like that. Yeah, too. she's yeah. I'm, it, it's coming to mind, but I, I don't have it. Jane, if you're here, <laughs> she she actually was. I saw a, a, a chat in by her, so she was. Well, anyway, sure she still is. But anyway. Okay. Well, anyway, just um, trying to set the record straight. Okay, it's better than bullet points. Better than. Oh, uh, okay. Points. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, Cliff Atkinson wrote something with a similar title. Yeah, two similar books. Okay. I mean, I don't know if the books are similar, but right. the titles are similar. Okay. Better than bullet points. Oh, boy, I hope Jane's not going to be mad at me now. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Um, let's see. This goes back to early on. Uh, we got about two minutes. Can you please review the significance of grouping? What does it cause our minds to do? Boy, that's, a, that's becoming a tough one to get across. Uh, there are certain conditions, visual conditions, that cause our minds to see individual objects as groups. And we will put meaning on that, whether it's meant to be there or not. So we will think that things are associated, and we will assume that there's a relationship between the individual elements if we perceive them as a group. I think, I think I forgot to say that, and that might be why people are confused about it. So we'll see relationships, and we'll see associations. 
when we see things as a group, between elements when we see them as a group. I hope that helps. Is that, is that better? I think that's great. Oh, good. Tracy Parrish says, better than bullet points, creating engaging e-learning with PowerPoint. And Jane has a 2013 coming out soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Well, we're about up. I want to take this opportunity to thank Connie, and I do want to plug uh, her website. I love her website, the e-learning coach that you see That's on the great. screen right now. I, I think it's, um, I, I, I love it. I, I think it's great. Um, you will get access to the recorded video of this webinar, folks, as well as um, a PDF that has um, a file of Connie's slides that she displayed today. And I want to thank you all for attending. We know that your time is valuable, so we really appreciate your decision some, to spend some of it with us. You will receive a very brief eight-item evaluation in email. Your feedback is important because we do make changes, actually. So we hope you'll complete it. Until then, this is Greg Williams from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Thanks, folks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.